Schuler, and uh, we begin by singing our opening hymn, that's 214. 214. Today our focus is on the last Judgment Sunday, so we're talking about the end of the world, and our message is starting a two-part series, What Did You Expect? Again, we begin by singing hymn 214. Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, 
given his only son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
five through ten. Few cases in a courtroom these days uh, breach litigation. Plea bargains are made and deals are cut. Innocent defender, defendants would rather pay off plaintiffs than risk losing in a court of law. And that was what was occurring too in Paul's time. Many are banking on cutting a deal in the courtroom on the last day. And surely they think they are good enough. But God's ruling will be just. Those who neither acknowledge nor obey him will be punished. But those who have acknowledged him in faith will marvel at his majesty and be brought to glory. We read from 2 Thessalonians 1. This is evidence of God's righteous verdict that resulted in your being counted worthy of God's kingdom, for which you also suffer. Certainly it is right for God to repay trouble to those who trouble you and to give relief to you who are troubled along with us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his powerful angels, he will exercise vengeance in flaming fire on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Such people will receive a just penalty, eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from his glorious strength. On that day, when he comes to be glorified among his saints, and to be marveled at among all those who have believed, because our testimony to you was believed. This is the Epistle of our Lord. Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. 
So he said, a man of noble birth traveled to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then to return. He called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. Conduct business until I return, he said to them. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to be king over us. When he returned after receiving the kingdom, he summoned the servants to whom he had given the money. He wanted to find out what they had gained by conducting business. The first one came to him and said, Master, your mina has earned ten more minas. He said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you were faithful in a small matter, you will have authority over ten cities. The second one came and said, Master, your mina has produced five more minas. So he said to him, You will be over five cities. And another one came and said, Master, here is your mina that I laid away in a piece of cloth. For I was afraid of you, since you are a demanding man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, You wicked servant, I will judge you with your own words. You knew that I am a demanding man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Then why did you not put my money in the bank? Then when I returned, I could have collected it with interest. He said to those standing there, Take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. But they said to him, Master, he already has ten minas. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Now as for those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. This is the Gospel of our Lord. <laughs>
speaking to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who allows <coughs> pain to come into our lives not because he wants to punish us, but to draw us closer to him. Our text is John 9, reading verses 1 through 11. As Jesus was passing by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that this man was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned, nor his parents, but that God's good works, God's works might be revealed in connection with him. Must do something missing there. I must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and spread the mud on the man's eyes. Go, Jesus told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. His neighbors and those who had seen him before this as a beggar asked, Isn't this the one who used to sit and beg? Some said, He is the one. Others said, No, but he looks like him. He kept saying, I am the one. So they answered him, How were your eyes opened? He answered, The man who is called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and told me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. In the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, Pastor, can you come to the hospital? They're taking our daughter into the hospital for surgery. They think it's cancer. She's only 22. She's our baby girl. Pastor, we don't understand why God would do this. Why would he allow this to happen to her? Is God punishing us for some grievous sin that we committed? She is so young. <clears throat> so maybe that hasn't exactly happened to you, because, but because we live in a sin-infected world, Something like that will probably happen in your lifetime, maybe to your family. Maybe you have experienced something like that already, and if you have, you know that it'll surely happen again, since we live in a sin-broken world. What do you say to a loved one that questions God? Why is God doing this to our family? Maybe it's a question that you have asked. And what's the answer? What does a pastor say to that heartfelt question? More importantly, what does God say? We may think that in the words like, has God abandoned me? Or has he turned against me because of some grievous sin I have committed? Does God have a purpose for our suffering? And today we begin our two-part series called, What Did You Expect? Well, I'll tell you what most of us expect. We expect a good life, don't we? We expect life to be one of happiness and roses and ease and comfort. That's what we expect. We look forward to days of joy and pleasure. But tragedy and disease may occur, and that may question our faith and pull us away from God. Cancer, a paralyzing car accident, kidney dialysis, or a chronic disease may make us doubt God's love. And yet the prophets, the apostles, and uh, Jesus himself have informed us that we will experience pain and suffering. God wants us to see though the plans and the purposes that he has for suffering, his suffering people and encourages us to entrust our broken hearts to him. Today we will answer the question, what did you expect? Like this. Expect pain with a purpose. For eight chapters, John has recorded how Jesus shares the gospel and is teaching people about the kingdom of God. God's kingdom is not what we do, but it is what our Savior has done. It is about the unbelievable claims that Jesus made, that he was God, and that he was sent on a mission from his Father. These claims are supported by instruction and by the miracles that he performed. Jesus is nearing now the end of his ministry, and the hostility from his enemies is growing more intense. Instead of believing him as his Savior, they hated him. In John 8, 
when Jesus says, I am from above, you are of this world. I am not of this world. For if you do not believe that I am the one, you will die in your sins. He declares that he is God. Jesus is united with the one who has always has existed, who he is now and ever will be. That comes from when God told Moses at the burning bush. And Moses asked God what, what, he, what his name was. And God said to him, I am who I am. Or as the Hebrew states, Yahweh, or Jehovah, as we say in English, who is the God of free and faithful grace. And when he made that claim, when Jesus made that claim that he was the great I am, he was claiming that he was greater than Moses or than Abraham, who was considered the great ancestor of the Jewish faith. And then they picked up stones to throw at him, and they wanted to kill him. But Jesus amazingly <coughs> walked through him, uh, through them, and hid himself, so they didn't know where he was. As Jesus was leaning out of love for those enemies. He leaves them with one last miracle to show that he is indeed the one the Father has sent. For Jesus comes to us in the midst of our suffering and hardship and pain, and he's there even in the, the greatest obstacle we have, that of eternal death. And this is the backdrop for Jesus' words at the start of chapter 9, where John says, As Jesus was passing by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? That's a very critical query, isn't it? The disciples asked, why is this man in this condition? Was it certainly he or his disciples must have done something wrong? But instead of just asking why, they accused this man and his parents or his parents of committing some grievous sin. Remember the introduction where the pastor gets a call and there's the spiritual shepherd and he says, Pastor, some of the members says, Pastor, please come to the hospital. My husband has a heart attack and he's only 45 years old and he's not responding. Pastor, I don't know <coughs> if he doesn't recover. How will I and the children survive? Why would God allow this to happen? He is so young. We desperately need him. Why is God doing this to us? Let's suppose that the pastor responded, Well, you tell me. What have you done wrong? What sin has your husband committed that God would make him act like this? You tell me that, and I will tell you why God is so angry at you. If you heard those words from a pastor, that'd probably be the last time you ever talked to him. And he probably wouldn't go back to the church he's serving either. Obviously, the disciples were thinking that this man was born blind for the wrong reason. And they thought that this man did something very egregious, and that he, or otherwise he wouldn't be suffering like this. And you know that's what a lot of people think. That's the first thing that sometimes comes to people's mind, that somebody did something so terrible that God would, would put this on them. But in times of crisis, how many people haven't called out to God? Why? <coughs> what did you do that I did I do to offend you that you have done this to us, Lord? Why are you allowing me to suffer with a heart condition, lupus, or diabetes? How would you squash that idea with more than just emotions? How would you refute that idea from God's word that God doesn't have a motive like this? In your affliction, that's not his purpose. How important is it for us to answer, not to answer like this? Some say pain is given by God over personal sin. We need to declare that God has a far different reason for allowing pain into a person's life. For those who believe in Jesus as their Savior, we can confidently declare that God is not abandoning you. He is not punishing you. God is gracious and merciful, and he has permitted this for your benefit. Do you know God's word well enough to answer those difficult questions? For it wasn't a problem uh, with the dis just a problem with the disciples and the religious leaders. It's a problem for us today, too. <coughs> All of us do still doubt God's mercy and grace as we face times of affliction. 
Do you know the Bible well enough that you can stand firm knowing that God will bless you in this tragedy? Think about some of the heroes of faith. When you read through the scriptures, you repeatedly hear about tragedies that the heroes of faith had to go through and how God blessed them and how His glory was shown through them. Think of Joseph, who suffered at least 20 years in the land, in the foreign land of Egypt. He was unjustly enslaved, accused, and imprisoned, all because his brothers were jealous. And during those 20 years, Joseph may have had some questions. Like, why, God? Why? Why are you inflicting me like this? And decades later, he discovered that God was not only saving his family, but the nation, but many other nations as well. God did this to preserve the line of the Savior that countless people might be saved. So 2,000 years later, the Savior of the world could be born. Remember how Joseph's life and God's glory shone through him and how he rescued sinners in need. When Joseph revealed himself to his brothers, he said, Do not be upset. We are angry with yourselves for selling me to this place, since God sent me at Pedagogy to preserve life. And after their father Jacob had died and went to heaven, Joseph stated again, Do not be afraid, for I am, am I in the place of God? You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring this to pass and to keep many people alive. Think about Job. The whole book of Job is written about what to expect about our pain and suffering. Do you remember how Job lost all of his cattle, uh, oxen, donkeys, camels, and servants, and even hit all his children in one day? And understandably, Job tore his robe and shaved his head in anguish, and he fell on the ground yet though and worshipped God, saying, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. You remember how the Lord praised Job, and he allowed Satan to afflict Job. Satan said to God, But stretch out your hand and strike his bones and his flesh, and he will certainly curse you and die. And after Satan afflicted Job with painful sores over his whole body, his wife said, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. But Job replies, If we accept the good that comes from God, shouldn't we also accept the bad? Job's so-called friend said, What did you do, Job? What did personal sin are you guilty of that you are suffering like this? Just confess your sin and give it over to God and He will stop punishing you. And after some 37 chapters of poor advice, God appears and He rebukes Job's friends and He confronts Job with questions about divine justice, God's power and His control. God never does reveal to Job why he had to suffer except that it was not over some personal sin. And yet Job repents of his foolishness and his foolish comments and he learns to trust God's power and to give, and in return he gave him twice as much as he had before. This struggle was all about God's glory and demonstrating that the Lord is more powerful than Satan who wanted to destroy Job and defy God. How about Jesus? Did anyone ever suffer more than Jesus? When he was on the cross, when he was disfigured beyond any human recognition of a man, then Isaiah's prophecy was, was fulfilled. We considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But God was faithful. And after three days, he allowed that pain uh, by that, uh, he, he showed that by that pain and by that suffering and by uh, that death, that life would be given. The glory of God would shine like it never had before, and sinners who believed would be rescued from their pain and hardship. Would you use those accounts as proof against this awful idea 
that God is abandoning you, that God is punishing you when you are suffering, would you remember how he treats all his children? He treats us all the same. He loves us. He doesn't treat any one of us any differently. How by the blood of Jesus he swears that everything, yes, everything, will work together for the good of those who love him. Can you imagine God who offers his son to Jesus, who has poured out his blood on the cross to save those who are undeserving from the worst pain imaginable, that's eternal hell. And then can you imagine that he would go against that? He saves us by his mercy and grace. God would not fulfill such amazing <laughs> things for us and then forget to tell us or disown us when we have cancer or heart surgery as if the omniscient God who planned eternity through his only son would somehow forget or punish us for an offensive act. That would despise Christ's sacrifice. God would never do that. Christians may suffer because of a sin-broken world, and they may suffer consequences for some sin in our life. But God is not punishing us, nor is he abandoning us. No, God is letting his glory shine through you. Jesus clearly tells us in John 9, Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that God's works might be revealed in connection with him. That's the gift that Jesus, that's the reason that uh, this took place. Take note of this truth in God's word as we examine this spiritual question what did you expect? What should you expect when you're afflicted? God's answer says, your pain is appointed for you so that the glory of God might be displayed in you. In you. God's glory is shown in your rescue. And then it's a testimony for the salvation of others. See how Jesus proves that in our text. After saying this, Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and spread the mud on the man's eyes. Jesus wanted the blind man to feel the power, God's power of healing. And he said, go, Jesus told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. The pool was on the south side of Jerusalem, so the man may have had to walk a few steps to get there. Just as Jesus kept telling his enemies he was sent from God to rescue us, so now Jesus sent this blind man to be cleansed in the pool named Sent. And so the blind man went and washed, and he came back seeing. His neighbors and those around him who had seen him before this uh, as a beggar asked, Isn't the one, is this the one who used to sit and beg? Some said he is the one. Others said no, but he looks like him. They couldn't believe that, it, uh, that he could see. But he kept saying, I am the one. So they asked him, how were your eyes open? After 30, over 30 years of suffering, now this man could see. And he answered, the man who was called Jesus made mud, and he spread it on my eyes and told me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. You and I are headed for a moment like that. A moment that, that says, whether it's in this life or whether it's in eternity, that whatever affliction that we may occur, in our life that we have to endure. There is a moment coming when our eyes will be opened and we will say, God, you have been so good to me. You rescued me from my affliction. You paid for all my sins and allowed me to have eternal life. Other people will certainly be affected by that moment too. As a pastor, whenever we have a distress call to come to the hospital or to the home of a member who is near death, we always want to come with a word of encouragement and comfort and hope. It's so beautiful that when we arrive at the hospital or house to encourage the afflicted member, when instead we are encouraged. When we hear the father of a little boy whose soul the Lord will soon bring to heaven say, Pastor, I see God's hand in this and how God has allowed this to happen to bless us. Pastor, you should hear my little boy speak about Jesus. He's so excited about seeing him. You can tell the nurses, the doctors, and everyone who has seen our faith that they want what we have. 
In this world, they are just looking for answers. They want peace. Pastor, I don't know how much time we have with our little guy here, but I do know we'll see him again. And I know that Jesus came into this world for moments like this. We are at peace. And that's the gift that Jesus gives to us in the face of our pain, suffering, and eternal, especially death. And that's the comfort that people are searching for in this world. The world is dying to understand this truth. People in the world are crying out for this truth. Lord, where are you? Why have you abandoned me? Are you punishing me? And as Christians, we have the, the uh, privilege to tell them in the gospel and say, no, that it is just the opposite. This is happening in your life so that you might learn about Jesus, to trust him and appreciate how much he loves you. And as you face whatever pain and suffering you must endure in this life, practice three things. First, contemplate what emotions you will have when the news of that pain comes. You need to be ready for that moment, for it will come. And you will need to endure suffering, pain, and, and uh, hardship because we live in a sin-broken world. As a Christian, you will have to endure it even more because Satan wants us to doubt God's promises. And as you cry and you ask God why uh, he is allowing this, know that he understands and he welcomes such prayers of desperation. Read the Psalms and see those emotions in many of them. For instance, David wrote, Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye grows weak with sorrow. Yes, my life is consumed by grief and my ears by groaning. I will be glad and rejoice in your mercy because you saw my affliction. Then remember the words that he is not abandoning you, that he's not forsaking you. You are not being punished. God is rescuing you so his glory can shine through you. Secondly, I want you to prepare a witness to God's grace for such a time of suffering. Think through uh, how God is there for you, how he has proven himself to you through past promises, such as the Lord uh, himself goes with you and will be with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Later in John's Gospel, Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. And then with confidence, I want you to rehearse a prayer for strength, like Joseph and Job and Jesus, to see the purpose in pain. That is what you can expect from God, the Lord who has already proved his love for you through Christ's suffering and death on the cross and how he conquered death for you. And then may you stand firm like Job, who despite his afflictions, afflictions praised the Lord and said, The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Amen. May the peace that surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Please stand for prayer. Included in our prayers this morning are prayers for Eric Kratz, that is, the, he is one of the sons of Keith and Carol, who has been hospitalized for seven days. All our redeemed, both far and wide, since you, O Lord, for all I have died, O teach us whatsoever, whatsoever be tied, to love them only. Dear Lord Jesus, this world is brimming over with iniquity. Satan, our arch foe, is getting bolder in his attacks upon Christianity. The depravity of mankind is almost beyond belief. Love grows cold as greed and selfishness flourish in men's hearts. The nations of earth have set themselves against you. On every hand are those who despise what you regard as holy and delight to do those things we know to be evil. Waves of crime and violence in our streets have become commonplace. Family and home have broken down as marriage vows once spoken in earnest are flung aside. Children are no longer taught to be obedient and respectful. People trust their own knowledge and have fashioned God in their own image. They are self-righteous and proud. As we stand in this world doomed to destruction, comfort us with the knowledge that if you have loved us with an amazing love, fill us with the peace that comes from knowing that we have God's full forgiveness because of the sacrifice you made for our sins. Comfort our uh, dis despairing spirits with your promises of everlasting life. By the Spirit, strengthen our faith through word and sacrament. Make us watchful each day for your reappearing in glory to deliver us from this present evil world. Do not let the growing darkness of ungodliness put out the light of knowledge you have given us by faith. May we never grow weary of resisting sin or doing good, knowing this is our reasonable service of love to you who first loved us. Preserve our faith that we may finally wear the crown of glory. Enable each of us to be a source of strength and courage to others. Draw our hearts to you so that we remain in constant touch with you through prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the selfish service of those who risk their lives to protect our nation, preserve our freedoms, and restore peace in the face of brutal aggressors. Grant the relief to those who continue to experience emotional or physical agony from their days of combat. Give us a sense of responsibility for their welfare. Comfort those who mourn for loved ones who died while performing their duty to our country. Thank you for the men and women who currently serve in our armed forces. Protect them, Lord, and be with their families and loved ones. Comfort those who have lost one who loans or await a word of those who are missing in action. Bring peace to war zones by shining the light of your gospel uh, on those who oppose you, and through it bring hope to this troubled world. Enlist all who are in our military forces into your church militant, that they may pledge eternal loyalty to Christ our King, and know his peace. Lord God, our refuge and strength, who is an ever-present help in trouble, we mercifully pray for Eric Pratt and take, to take him into your loving care. Give knowledge and skill to the physicians and surgeons as he deals with his diabetes that is out of control, his gastroparesis and kidney dialysis. If it is your will, continue to allow him to live. If these are his last days, comfort his family and those who love him, including us, with the knowledge that he knows you, that you are his child, and that he will be by your side forever in heaven. Help him to accept the hardships and pain, and yet know that it is all for his good. We ask all of this in your name. Amen. We join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. 
sacrament that's found on page 21 in the front of your room. The Lord be with you.
may be received in Christ your body and his holy precious blood, assure you how much the Lord loves you, that he was willing to die on the cross to forgive all your sins so that you could have the hope of eternal life and the surety of that. May that inspire you to live lives of glory to him. The peace of God be with you. When the music starts, <laughs> we'll sing the communion hymn straight through.
sing the song of Simeon, uh, thanking God for the blessings of the Lord. So, Silverware, 
Um, Pat Tish also thanks you for all the birthday cards, uh, calls, and blessings on our birthday. Uh, the deacons meet this Monday at 6.30, the church council at 7. Uh, mission festival is next Sunday. Pastor Rush Sharptran will uh, be the guest speaker and inform us of uh, the work that the Lord is doing at this Michigan Lutheran Seminary. And we will also, in our worship service, encourage uh, each other in um, uh, hearing about uh, uh, home missions and how God's work is, is uh, growing in his kingdom. Uh, I don't think I have anything else. Just uh, as long as we're passing out thanks, thanks Marianne. Um, today you had a uh, whole help with organist. You did very well. <laughs> I'm not sure the organ would have worked today, so <laughs> um, I'll reach out on the way out and uh, oh, one more name. Um, yeah. yeah, this is for Connie too. Many of you may have seen the bulletin board in the hallway with the tree with the leaves. The idea was that we were all going to put on a leaf, something we're thankful for, and by the Thanksgiving meal and Thanksgiving that tree would be full of leaves, kind of the reverse of what just happened this last couple of days. But it didn't quite happen according to plan for a lot of reasons. We do have leaves. I have markers. If you'd be willing to put something on one of those leaves before you leave, we would definitely appreciate it. Yeah, and the leaves are small, so. Yeah. <laughs> I put a sign up sheet for the poinsettias uh, on the back. They're twelve dollars this year from where I get them. So, uh, but if you sign up, I need a top by the thirtieth of the month. So you got a couple of weeks. Okay. Anybody else? Have we passed the deadline for the food bank thing? We are. Yeah, well, yeah, I should have mentioned that. I was going to. I, I really put this up again for the line that's underneath there with monetary gifts. That's what I said last last time. Those are easier sent. So you can make them out to Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary, or you can make them out to the church, and then the church will send it in total. But yes, the as far as the all the the that is, but it's easier to send a check and still support it than it is to send a truck with the paying for the gas and the and the expense of somebody driving it and, and that and the goods. So if you'd like to uh, either uh, you know make it out to the church and point seminary or food bank on the lower left or you can make it out to Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary and we'll send it on for you. Thank you for that. I probably won't put it in next week. Anybody else? Okay. I'll reach you in later.